matter how we look at what's happening in the world, and no matter how we look at how you perceive the world, one of the greatest transformers of consciousness, one of the greatest cultivators of presence, one of the most potent catalysts that brings you out of the narrative of ego and into the timeless nature of your soul is incubating in an experience called uncertainty. And so when I call tonight's teaching Facing Uncertainty, it is the courageous will to allow the uncertainty of life instead of causing you to find other certainties to hide in, to actually to come out of hiding and to face uncertainty as if the words themselves are saying facing uncertainty is how we allow the hands of fate to lift the veil or mask of ego from the true self looking through it. And I want to take you through a process where I help you face uncertainty without looking for other levels of certainty to hide in. The process of uncertainty, or what it does for us as a spiritual catalyst of awakening. The process of uncertainty is actually where we shift in, through our maturing out of the narrative of ego and learning how to live in such a state of alignment and maturity that we actually can transform and heal without the need of a narrative. Now, in a lot of other teachings, they'll frame it a different way. They'll speak about it with different words. And because the teachings I represent is the most loving and compassionate way to get from A to B, I happen to think that sometimes when people talk about the story, you know, they'll say, drop your story, if you've heard that teaching. I find that to be not very compassionate. And I find it to be very... Um, cruel to say to someone who has been neglected or abused to drop their story. I find that to be abusive. And so I'm not here to say drop your story. I want to respectfully first explain to you what the purpose is of having a story. Because I don't want you to try to get rid of your story. Simply because your story is there to protect you until you're strong enough and courageous enough to evolve without one. In the same way, I would never ridicule a child for having training wheels on their bicycle because the training wheels is how children stay safe before they learn to balance. So what's the purpose of having a story? Because strangely enough on the spiritual path, there's many paths that try to get you to a reality beyond concepts, a reality beyond story, a reality beyond the veil of ego. And if you have a teaching that is trying to deliberately move you beyond a story, you know, with words like let it go, which let it go is a very potent teaching. In fact, in my new book, which comes out in March, the universe always has a plan, the 10 golden rules of letting go I teach you about letting go, which is very different than let it go. Let it go is very dogmatic. And, and, and they are words that I would never speak to you, my own innocent heart, or any child dwelling in the heart of any adult. Because you're not the one who lets it go. You are the one who lets go so that what is really gripping you can let go of you. As I've said before, you're not the one who lets go. You are the one being let go of. And so when we talk about the story, the story that basically has a narrative that says you are the product of your past, of your familial patterns, of your upbringing, of your culture, of your gender, or the gender of your choosing, all of these things have a purpose. 
So I don't ever look at anyone's experience and go, God, look at that story. In fact, it's one of the reasons I'm able to hold the space I hold and help so many of you transform because I don't naturally have judgments over people's experiences because I'm too interested in your experience. And it's my interest in experiences since I was a very young person that has caused me to pay such close attention that I've started to see how things happen and the way we can get out of them in the most loving way. So what I will say is when you, as an aside to this, when you're with family members, partners, and friends, when you're around other people who are very much attached to their story, what you're in the presence of is a human being who is attached to a shield, which means you're in the presence of someone who is so afraid of being hurt, neglected, or abused that they're hiding behind the shield of a narrative. And when you see someone who may or may not know how afraid they are, the compassion in our hearts say, may I be the safety for this person and remind them how safe they are to be as they wish instead of finding myself becoming short-tempered and aggravated because of the things people wedge between our connection. And all you have to do is get interested. You have to be one step more interested in other people than you are interested in the things you believe about other people or yourself. So what's the purpose of a story? Because I'm a writer. I love a good story. I don't want you to drop your story. Just tell me an epic one. Because this entire world with each of us and all of our lives being the various chapters of the most epic novel that's ever been written. When you go to heaven, you're gonna watch your life back on Life Review. And you're gonna look at your life story, not from the perspective of the main character, but from the perspective of the one who wove the tale. And as soon as you see it from that different perspective, you will want nothing more than to get back into the story so you can try to live it out differently. So all the fancy teachings that say drop your story don't understand how important the story is. And really the way a story begins to be crafted as a shield that your ego uses to hide behind is really an act of mercy because <clears throat> everything that happens in this lifetime, since the moment you were born prior to birth and throughout all births and deaths, <laughs> as many of us probably understand very deeply, every moment of being alive in a human body is the opportunity to experience the transformation and expansion of your soul from start to finish. There is no moment in this world that is for any other purpose but spiritual evolution including the joys and the pleasures of being in a body and all of the worldly pleasures we get to enjoy with our senses. And so we know that because we've either been here before, a lot of us remember coming from different incarnations. Some of us are from different planets and solar systems. And this might be our first time on this planet. Some of us don't look up at spaceships and think, what's their agenda? We think, family reunion. <clears throat> right? And we're all having different experiences. Someone might go, Matt, Matt, there's a ship. What do they want? And I'm like, you mean Frank? The karaoke king of the cul-de-sac and the Pleiades? He's a blast, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, he's three feet tall, he's gray, but once you get to know him, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> yeah, newsflash, there's karaoke in the Pleiades. I can't confirm that, I assume.
But the story, the story is created from your highest consciousness, even though a lot of the stories aren't of the highest consciousness. The story doesn't have to be of the highest consciousness to be something helping you that comes from your highest consciousness, which I think is a fascinating thing. And the purpose of a story is that it gives you tangible, perceivable, real life evidence to justify why you're feeling what you're feeling. So a lot of us know the transformational process. You get triggered, you feel an explosive emotion, and you know, whether you know from your own experience or my teachings, what you're feeling is a healing taking place. And as you feel this emotion, you can also sense maybe the top of your head blowing off and like a volcano, energy shooting out and going back to source. And yet the story is the introduction to a lot of people that says what you're going through isn't just because of what people do or don't do. It's a deeper healing where you are healing your lineages, your ancestry. We are all doing things for much bigger reasons. But the story gives you a human melodrama because the purpose of a story is to give attention to our emotions. Now in the beginning, you will give attention to the emotions with a story about who caused it, who's to blame, there will be judgments, all these things. But at least it brings attention to the emotional body. As you evolve, you will find yourself releasing and clearing a lot of the density of the story. And usually the way it works is that you will have less and less of a story to hide behind the more you get onto the fact that any healing taking place is a gift of your evolution, not that you are a victim of your circumstance. So it's all a trajectory of consciousness. And you get to a place where you are so well aware <clears throat> that everything is an activation, a clearing, an integration. You become so well versed in the healing transformational process that you don't require your external world to play out these characters and experiences to justify why you feel the way you do. So there's a reason why stories exist and to belittle people for having stories is like ridiculing an infant for crawling instead of walking. Look at that baby, being such a baby. <laughs> Why are you being such a baby, baby? <laughs> right, you wouldn't say that. That's ridiculous. But, but when it comes to spirituality, oh, look at that person with that story over there. Yeah, don't get too close. They're gonna lower your vibration. <laughs> oh my God, oh my God. I'm, no, no, I, here's, <laughs> I'm looking at the David Hawkins power versus force chart. I am muscle testing how much my vibration is dropping right now. <laughs> because of their story. I was at joy, now I'm back to neutral that fast. <laughs> Heading right to shame if I don't get the hell away from this person. <laughs> Isn't it weird how we hear this stuff and we laugh at God, that's judgmental, but when you're in certain spiritual settings, in the name of spirituality, we can justify a lot of weird things. So I'm not just saying waking up to the highest possibility of your true enlightened nature, waking up out of the density of ego, but even waking up out of the density of the spiritual ego. And often what happens is people go from having a egoic story to having a spiritual egoic story, right? And then when you learn some spiritual stuff, but you're still operating from the same patterns of ego, we have what's called a spiritual ego. And there can even be people that work in the field as healers that have not really address their density. And when you have that combination of a healer that is still operating from a place of ego, I've thought about this recently and I've come up with a new archetypal term. I think you'll like this one. This is, I'm very proud of this. That's why I'm taking a breath before I share it with you. <laughs> Prepare yourself, YouTube. You will tell your children about me. To me, the archetype of when there's a healer who hasn't really addressed their density, they become what I call the gaslight worker. <laughs> I 
<laughs> and if you've ever experienced the gaslight worker, just like if you've ever gone to a healer and they do some healing and you go, I saw you wave your hands for the life of me, I can't feel a thing. And the gaslight worker says to you, you must be in resistance. <laughs> really? And it escalates and escalates and basically becomes where the ego projects its unconsciousness onto those that are not having a similar experience. And again, when we wake up out of ego, we allow people to have stories because stories are where we start to learn that in the story of you as a person, surrounded by all the people that have supposedly shaped you into the person you are, which is true, by the way, until you wake up in consciousness. And when you wake up in consciousness, you actually realized that the conditioning you thought that shaped you was a dream because you are that which has both never been conditioned you are that which cannot be conditioned. And so we have a story, so we have a launching pad of something to wake up from. And when you're around other people that are in their story, you're just around those that are being prepared for an awakening. And they are in the presence of you who is in your journey of awakening and you're reflecting to them what is waking up in them. And equally so, you being around people that are in their stories is one of the greatest ways for you to check your math. People who are in stories and people who are in egos are the greatest people for people waking up to be around. Because it will teach you that your job is not to wake up other people in your life. Your job is to wake you up. And when you have a need for other people in your life to be like you, that's why you're around people who seem unlike you. <laughs> because it's God dressed up as supposedly messed up people saying, speak the language of emotion, not this spiritual stuff. Because spiritual stuff is for us. When we gather in community, we can come to the Star Trek convention and talk Vulcan language to each other <laughs> and wear our pointy ears and do the whole thing. But when you go out there and you're around the world, your family, that's when you have to tuck it in. <laughs> it's, it's not let it go, it's tuck it in. See, that makes sense. Tuck it in. Someone came to me, Matt, I have, I have had an awakening and I have to go around my family. What should I do? Tuck it in. <laughs> Tuck it in. They go, what do you mean by that? And I said, you know all this stuff you like to talk about? They said, yeah. I said, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that at all. Well, what, do, well, what do I talk about? Them. Them. The fact that you are around people who seem so self-absorbed in themselves and don't seem to give a you-know-what about you is giving you a break from you. <laughs> and all you have to do is be interested in them and realize this is my spiritual training. Right? The fantasy of if only I could have a family who was spiritual, then you'd be in a cult. <laughs> That's the truth. Eight times out of 10, and this is just my experience, eight times out of 10 where I talk to someone and says, yeah, man, I was raised in a family that was all about spirituality. Really, what cult was that? <laughs> because there's a reason why none of us grow up like this. Because it's not what you need. What you need is the setup. What you need is the story. And what you need is to be established in a story where you think you are someone, somewhere, going some other place. And that's when you are ready to wake up. And what's interesting is a lot of us have these conflicts where we look at our families and we look at people and we think, God, if they could only see my point of view, if they could only be like me, but the truth is, other people cannot see outside of their narrative in ego. 
In ego, you only see from one narrative, which is the first person point of view. The only thing capable of seeing beyond that is consciousness. And the only way for you to hold a space for someone else to be conscious is for you to activate and awaken your consciousness. So when you're around people, and again, I'm not saying you should be around people that don't feel good to be around, but when you're around people like family or whoever, or you're at work, and it just doesn't feel good, you have to also remember, how are these people in their most unconscious state actually helping me to be rooted in my consciousness? What do I have to let go of judgmentally in myself in order to see them as a gift instead of a curse? And if they are triggering all these spiritual ideas in me about superstition and lowering my vibration, and oh my God, they might have entities, they're gonna jump inside of me. <laughs> Maybe they're just bringing up all the things that are keeping you living out a very small, spiritually themed reality. And so we have to always remember, when we are going through the process of waking up, the story or the narrative is there as a launching pad for evolution, and oftentimes it is the state of uncertainty that is helping us go from hiding behind a story of self-image and going into a reality where we feel so free and liberated, we don't need reasons to justify our experiences. And that's the advanced level of awakening. Because which, which is weirder? Having circumstances that seem so real to be the cause of your pain, right? I, I, I was happy and then I met this person who's now called my ex or whatever people's experience is, right? And you think, God, I was so happy until they came around. I'm just speaking to people's common experiences. Or which is more strange, no context. I was sitting on a beach in Jamaica, looking at the sunrise, feeling very grateful. And then anxiety erupted. And you have no reason or context. And you would find out that even though the story is probably the easiest place for you to go into judgment, having no context for why things are happening actually makes you so ungrounded, so much easier. And so even though people use stories to justify judgment, and we can talk about the unconscionable actions that people do through the veil of their own inner storytelling or narrative, of course, but the merciful action of it or the merciful reasoning for it is that if you had no reason to justify your experiences, you're actually so much closer to going insane. <laughs> and so the universe would rather say, hmm, instead of insane, let's, uh, let's, let's veer to judgment land. And from judgment land, we can unpack from there. Because the universe is interested in the long game. <laughs> and as spiritual beings, we're not in the long game. We're in the short game, aren't we? How fast can I change this crap how fast can I manifest a new reality and how can I get in charge of everything and making it everything I want it to be and nothing I don't want it to be? Isn't that the dream some people have? And then you realize as you wake up, thank God I didn't have as much control as I thought I did. Right? Thank God when I was turning the steering wheel at seven years old, I wasn't really driving the vehicle. Because <laughs> I would have really hurt myself. So when we are alive in a time where we are living through the ascension process, this is the ascension process. This is it happening. But what's happening is we are seeing and feeling a world that is seeing the evolution of consciousness through many different narratives. And as you start to wake up yourself in consciousness, you unplug from a collective narrative and instead of seeing it from the perspective of what is dying or what is being lost or what is going to hell, you start to see it from the consciousness of what is being rebuilt, what is being reborn, and what is being expanded and cultivated in consciousness. And so the process of uncertainty is the most fertile soil for you to experience your greatest transformation. And right now on the planet, given the amount of uncertainty people have, this is the greatest opportunity you've been given. But it's all what you do with it.
And before we go any further, again, because I want to use it as an interactive experience, let's just, as a lot of you know, I do repeat after me statements. Let's just try this together and just see how it feels. I accept, I accept that, having a story that having a story or an inner narrative, or an inner narrative is, not wrong. is not wrong. It is a cosmic setup. So I have something to awaken from. And I accept that if I willfully try to let go of my story, I'm only making it stronger. And even if I were able to let go of my story, oh, what a bigger spiritual story I would have had. And I accept that the people that are the hardest for me to be around are because those are people who are hiding behind different stories and narratives where the way they perceive me is perhaps not the way I want to be seen. And especially if I derive, especially if I derive either, my sense of self either my sense of self or my sense of value, my sense of value from, the from the connections I feel with other people. I'm likely to try to rush them beyond their story so I can turn them into a character to seize this character the way I wish to be seen. But in consciousness, I don't have to manipulate anyone's story, nor do I have to be victimed, victimized thank you, by someone else's story. And in knowing it is so, I allow everyone in my life the right and privilege privilege to hide in their story. story. And if I need to hide in mine, mine, so be it. it. Because the only thing other people help me do do is awaken in consciousness. consciousness. And instead of asking other people to drop their story, story, what if I free others from the story I have of them. And so I'm free. Feel that for a moment. Yeah. Gangster. Magic. Magic. You see, that's when I talk about being polite and conscious and loving to all people. I'm not saying it to you because of how I want you to see me. I'm saying it because that's just the life I live. And part of the magic of how I live like this, which is not something I do in every moment and monitor at all, I don't. I just don't mind someone being in a story because that's their hiding spot. And as a healer and as an awakener of consciousness, I'm here to heal and awaken those who are ready to heal and awaken. And those who may not be ready are those who hide. So when I see someone hiding, and I can tell in a split second someone that's hiding, you know what I do? I let them hide. And I'll tell you why. Because you're not ready to heal and awaken until the awakening of your free will says, I desire this change. So I'm someone who can bring the change for those that desire it. And those who hide may not know what I know about hiding, and I'll teach you the secret. Hiding is like any other human experience or emotion. Hiding, or the feeling of sadness, or any action. Any feeling or action will be transformed in the light of consciousness when each person has spent enough time in every particular experience 
because it's the time you spend in an experience that cultivates the right amount of presence that allows consciousness to start waking up out of that hiding spot. So every human being has to literally spend a certain amount of time hiding before something within you says, I hide no longer. And so I'm not someone who's gonna rush someone through the process. I'm gonna say if they're hiding, that means they haven't spent enough time hiding. And of course, what do you do when you're hiding? If you're kind of aware that you're hiding, you judge the crap out of yourself for doing it. That's what you do. And when you go, oh my God, I'm hiding and I'm judging myself, you're doing it right. Part of the, part of the fallacy on this spiritual path is we think we're only doing healing work when we're doing things a certain way. I gotta tell you, any which way you're doing it is right. Oh my God, I'm this spiritual being and I chant and I light sage and I focus on my chakras and I'm judging people in my life. That's time well spent in a spiritual ego and you're judging yourself for judging others because your consciousness is becoming conscious of that pattern. And when consciousness starts to wake up to itself, the ego that is still kind of present as consciousness awakens becomes horrified of its behavior. So we have to give ourselves tremendous compassion because your ego, as the light of consciousness awakens before your ego disappears into the light, is horrified by its behavior. It's like someone who went out on a drinking binge and didn't know they were being filmed by their friend. And then the next day, watches the footage. <laughs> From their narrative, they were the mayor. Everything was great, we all had a good time. Oh my God, we should do this again. But the footage shows a different experience, doesn't it? <laughs> That's where we started the party. Those are the three or five things you barfed on. <laughs> That's where you begged me to never abandon you. <laughs> and under that table is where you passed out for the night. Bravo. So when we start to become conscious of our patterning, it's very hard. It's very embarrassing. It's very... Um, embarrassing is a good word. It's very embarrassing. It's very humbling. But we have to understand, and this isn't to justify any unconscious behavior, that you're gonna come to a point where you're gonna say to yourself, I need to stop doing what I'm doing. And you're gonna employ all these tactics in attempt to stop doing what you're doing. And on purpose, they're not gonna work. <laughs> because if they were to work, you would be under the impression that you were in control of this. You are a part of this, you are a collaborator in this. You have free will. It may not be in charge of the things you wish it were, but you're not in control of this. Your higher self is. And the ego that wants control of its destiny is not the one that can reach the part of you who has created this. They're one, but they're not the same. So you will have times in your life where you go, here's what's causing my pain. Here's what's bringing destruction to my family's life. I need to stop this. And with every positive intention, you will try. And maybe it will work for a little bit. But more times than not, it will not work. And we get so down on ourselves. But the reality is, is that we have to do the best we can do Right? We don't need to make audacious claims. We just need to be honest and go, I'm going to try to make some changes and I hope I can do it to the best of my ability. But you have to understand that there has to be a certain amount of time spent in certain states to build up the equity to ascend beyond those limitations. And so the greatest thing we can do as spiritual beings is not be so hard on ourselves, not require other people to accept us. That's your job. And it's your job to say, whatever I gain, I gain. Whatever I lose, I lose. And only I need to accept myself as I am. And maybe other people don't accept what you accept. And maybe for other people, they can't be around this process. It might be too messy for them. And we say, if you have somewhere else to be, I wish you well. 
because the only person who needs to learn how to be fully with you is you. And that can be heartbreaking and humbling to what might be lost given certain behaviors that people have to play out. And so I say this with the utmost humility. I want you to be able in a perfect world to find your limitations, to find your missteps, to find what you need to fix, and boom, you're a brand new person. And sometimes you can do that. But you can only do that if you spent enough time in lower states, totally playing out what that state is here to teach you so that you build up the amount of pressure to ascend beyond it. So a truly awake being has spent so much time in hell that the revelation of heaven has just been a humbling relief. A master is not someone at the highest rung of the ladder who looks at the lower rungs with judgment. Oh, I am the highest rung, look at these lower rungs. Like if you had a ladder, right? I probably said this in the last video. If you had a ladder with only the top rung, it wouldn't be a ladder. <laughs> you need every step. You need the lowest to get to the highest. You need kindergarten to get to grad school. Could you imagine applying for grad school? I'm so sorry, you didn't go to kindergarten. <laughs> That'd be horrifying. But you need to spend certain amount of time in every circumstance and emotional state. And so when human beings get into these really fascinating tailspins and they go, I don't have abundance. And then they flip through Facebook and there's a picture of someone, do you want to be abundant? Yes, I do. Well, here are the 10 easy steps. Take my fa fantastic abundance course and God bless people who teach like this. And you'll do the 10 steps, the five steps, the whatever. Because the spiritual ego is the most attracted to any amount of busy work that keeps you fantasizing about the different circumstances you want. To the point that you will start actually, in such a crafty manner, hallucinating how your environment is actually showing you that you're moving in the right direction. No, I think this is working. Ah, I'm feeling more abundant, this is good. And what will happen is, and I'm just being totally honest with you, you will wind up manifesting more abundance, synchronicities, expanded consciousness and flow, not because of the positive things you're trying to do, because you will have spent enough time in the opposite to make room for the opposite. We call this relationship between opposites polarity. And before you can enter a level of consciousness where both opposites disappear, the sense of time vanishes, and you're just rooted in the presence of your own eternal being as an enlightened master, before you get there, you have to experience the relationship between opposing forces. We have to spend time at night to get us into the next day or morning. We have to experience sadness to help us mature and have the worth to welcome greater joy. We have to experience scarcity so we can use our creative muscles to make the most out of very little so that we can be responsible and grounded when more is given. All of this has to do with the, the harmony of opposing forces. And the hallucination is that you will force yourself to do a bunch of erroneous spiritual busy work. That's a nice way of putting it. And then the moment where you've spent enough time in one state shifts to something positive, you think it's the busy work that did it. You see, it worked. You see, it worked. That's like someone in a prison cell who's going to be paroled on a certain date sits there and says, if I squeeze as hard as possible, I'm gonna speed up the parole process. And they just sit there and squeeze as hard as they can. And then on the date they were always meant to be paroled, they're let out of prison and they go, look, it worked. <laughs> At the end of the day, erroneous spiritual busy work is just what you do with the time you've been given 
to feel the way you don't want to be. And what I want to end tonight is you wasting any time negotiating with yourself. And we do that by facing uncertainty and welcoming it. And you could feel the energy in the air. Anytime you feel uncertainty, it usually is never going to feel right to you. And to your ego, whose narrative, right? What's the basic narrative of ego? The narrative is, I, the ego, refuse to change while expecting everything else to change at my whim and demand. And whenever you are faced with the uncertainty that is the cultivating presence that is unraveling you and freeing you from the hiding spot of your inner narrative, it never feels like you're doing it right. It always feels wrong. Or you always feel like, what is the universe telling me that I can't hear with my own senses? Or what am I missing? Or whatever the judgment is, if I was at a higher vibration, surely I would not be experiencing this. Again, as a repeat after me, let's have a little bit of therapy for a moment. A little spiritual ego therapy. Try this out loud with me. I accept, I accept that I'm feeling exactly the way I'm feeling because every person has a specific journey to live out. Where every person has to spend a certain amount of time under the pressure and intensity of various emotions and states. Because that's what cultivates presence within various emotions and states. And of course, the time I spend in one side of polarity is only making space for me to welcome the opposite side of polarity. So it's not the erroneous spiritual busy work that makes all of this better. better. It's the time I spend spend under the most intense, intense precarious, precarious and uncertain feelings feelings that cultivates presence presence to turn vulnerability vulnerability from weakness weakness into into a strength. And things like loving myself, myself. breath work, work. intention, Intention. and even mature healing modalities modalities. is not erroneous spiritual busy work. work. It is how I soothe and love my most innocent parts parts. as I make it safe and okay. What doesn't feel safe and okay to face? And as I become a greater parent to the inner child in me, all my experiences with my family of origin are forgiven on their own. And as I become a great parent to this inner child, I start to view myself through the eyes of source. To be one with the light that I am, have always been, and shall always be. And it's okay if I don't like how this feels. That means I'm doing it right. And if I like how this feels, same, same. No extra credit, right? <laughs> I remember I was talking to someone, just a friend of mine, and you know, they're going through a very deep trauma. You know, and when I'm, you know, I, I just want people to be honest. And I don't, you know, 
I let people decide what's honest for them, although I could feel. You know, we can always feel what's honest and not. You know, we can, we can feel what is that spirit, what I call the spiritual ego overlay, where it's like someone's hiding the truth of their gruesome experience and putting over it like some sort of shiny spiritual concept. Right? Like I was talking to a friend and they go, yeah, I'm really traumatized. But, but, but I, I, I accept it. I, I accept it. But it, didn't, it wasn't the feeling of acceptance. It was like, this is what I should say based on what I've read. Hey, God, aren't I doing a great job, right? And I leaned into them, to them. I said, you know, you don't get extra credit for that. And they go, what do you mean? I said, you accept this. Do you like how it feels? No, no, no. I said, just say that. I said, what do you mean? I said, tell me how shitty this is. That's what I want to hear. How shitty is this? <laughs> they looked at me and they said, you're allowed to do that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you are. You are. Because you can't fool the truth in you. And a lot of us as empathic spiritual beings are so afraid of being honest about our experience because we've been taught to think it's a judgment. Oh, I don't want to say the truth. That's a judgment. The truth is not a judgment. Judgment is only when you use the narrative of life to condemn someone with no room for them to be redeemed. True forgiveness is when you see the actions of this person may be completely irresponsible and unconscionable. And because this person is acting so out of character, it is their soul that I will pray for, for it is their transformation that will spare them of pain and spare them of hurting another person. So judgment is when you're so lost in your own inner narrative that you are refusing forgiveness for the people who need it the most. That's what a judgment is. But we as spiritually empathic people, we're so sensitive, we're so afraid of being judgmental that we're not always honest about our experiences. And instead we try to be honest about the way we politely package our experiences with spiritual concepts. It's like, it's like having a, it's like your, your pet went to the bathroom on your carpet and you've just sprinkled potpourri on it. Well, all I smell is lavender. <laughs> that solves that. We don't need to do that. We can be totally honest. And I think what's even more shocking is how the way people have misinterpreted things like manifestation, right? <laughs> the, sp the, the, the gaslight worker, the gaslight worker, God forbid you have something adverse happen in your life and the gaslight worker says to you, oh my God, you have adversity. What kind of thoughts have you been thinking? <laughs> Is that how life works? You have a crappy thought and then the piano falls from the sky in your head? <laughs> Let me just say this, life is crazy, right? Life is crazy. But if life were truly a manifestation of thought, we'd all be in big trouble. <laughs> Just think of half the crap you thought when you were 10. <laughs> what kind of world would you have created by the time you're an adult to be like, what did I do? <laughs> thoughts don't manifest reality. What thoughts do is, th because thoughts, thoughts that you think are your thoughts is the collective quantum field of thought which means here are all the possibilities that have been swirling around in the quantum field before you got to this planet. And thought is what people identify with, and then they go, that's a good idea, I'm gonna take that on, and they identify with it, and then they act out the behavior of that thought pattern. But none of the thoughts are your thoughts. The only thoughts that are yours are the ones that inspire you to be at your best and to move forward in consciousness. So the idea that you could have a negative thought, you, the, the negative thoughts you have isn't something you thought. It's something you witnessed being thought. And so for you to go, oh my God, I just had a negative thought. No, no, you witnessed a negative thought orbit the field of your mind. You didn't do that. And the idea that you thought it is just a different thought. So the idea that your thoughts create reality your thoughts create an attachment to a certain narrative. 
And if you believe certain streams of thought over and over again, you're telling yourself, keep looking for evidence that justifies this thought. So you don't create reality with thoughts, you create perceptions of reality with thoughts, which means if you identify with thoughts long enough, you're going to change your perception to only look for things that confirm the validity of that thinking. That's third dimensional consciousness. We are evolving beings. We were born into the third dimension, but when you were a kid, you were already awake from third dimension, which is why you looked around your family and go, how did I get here? <laughs> what raffle did I win to be around crazy people? <laughs> Do you remember that when you were young? Maybe you went to a parent, you asked a legitimate question and you got an answer and you thought, I will never ask you again. Do you remember the moment? Kind of like when you woke up out of Santa Claus? And you went, hmm, never ask them life advice, ever. Because you're already out of that construct. Thoughts don't create reality. So this whole idea, like, and again, it's the workings of the gaslight worker. Oh, hey, this happened to you. What have you been thinking lately? It's how someone sits on a high horse and demoralizes you because they themselves don't want to be in the state that you're in because you need to be around awakened beings who will sit with you in the mud and go, yeah, this is shitty, isn't it? And who will just hold your hand and say, hey, I'm just here to keep you company and I'm going to walk you through this. I will never blame your experiences on your thoughts because that, there's no reality in that. And the idea that you're going to spend time trying to think all these positive thoughts as fast as possible to outrun all your negative thoughts? <laughs> like, that's like spiritual aerobics. <laughs> like in the 80s when people wore leotards and the whole thing and leg warmers? That's just spiritual ego 101. And all of these things are just to show you superstition, judgments. And again, being honest about your experience isn't a judgment. Having an opinion is not a judgment. Having an opinion about someone's conduct is not a judgment because you're just saying, here's my basis of morality, here's their different basis of, re of morality, and this is what I'm not resonating with. But judgment is when you say their behavior is so egregious I refuse to allow forgiveness. And forgiveness doesn't mean I let it go. Forgiveness means, God, this one is acting atrocious. Transform them before any other human being so less people can be hurt and harmed. That's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness says, put this aching soul, put this person who can't stop harming people at the front of the line. Forgiveness says, I was next in line? No, they're next in line. Because I'm not hurting anyone, I can wait 10 more lifetimes. They must be redeemed before me. That's forgiveness. Forgiveness says, like a bodhisattva vow, may those that harm others as a result of the harm done to them, be transformed before me so no one else may be harmed. That's the beauty of forgiveness. Wake them up out of their narrative because their narrative is harming people. I can wait. <laughs> you know what my bodhisattva vow is to the universe? Everyone before me. I'm last. Because my breath is already of infinite blessings. Every breath I breathe is, of in, is the vapor of infinite diamonds taken in, purifying, and being sent out as abundance for every soul. Everyone before me. because everyone else is hurting way deeper than me. So in my reality, the hurt, the hungry, the betrayed, the ashamed, get it all 
before me because I don't need anything but the light of my consciousness in order to be. That's how we're going to change this world. And what gets you there is welcoming uncertainty and saying, thank you, circumstances, for not being the byproduct of thoughts, not being because of a vibrational standpoint, but for being the greatest thing that is unhooking me, unmasking me from my hiding spot. Thank you, circumstances, for showing me I cannot outrun the hands of fate. I cannot manipulate my way through this game. For this game is only the advancement of maturity and the only strategy in a game that is advanced through maturity is the strategy of honesty. Which is why the, only the truth shall set you free. And in the name of letting the truth set you free, Try this out loud. Repeat after me. I accept, I accept that any lower opposite, that any lower opposite is, only is only helping me clear out energy to build up momentum to, build up momentum to welcome the energy of the other opposite. Therefore, no matter my circumstances, I'm not missing out on anything, but simply the opportunity to be fully present with whatever I'm spending time healing by living it out. Every time I'm sad, no matter how I perceive it, no how I perceive it whether seeing it through the lens, through the lens of, fancy teachings, of fancy spiritual teachings or judging myself for being sad, or judging myself for being sad and then judging myself for judging myself for being sad, I accept that when I'm sad, I'm, sad I'm clearing out stagnant energy and building up the momentum, up the momentum to, welcome the to welcome the experience of happiness. Every time I feel fear, time I feel fear I'm clearing old energy, clearing old energy and, making and making room to welcome greater moments of courage. Moments of courage. Every, time I'm angry, Every time I'm angry, I'm clearing out old energy and making room to welcome greater moments of passion. Every time I'm envious, I'm clearing out old energy and making room to welcome moments of gratitude. Every time I'm ashamed, I'm clearing old energy and making room to welcome moments of greater confidence. Every time I'm guilty, I'm clearing old energy and making room to welcome greater moments of liberation. Every time I act from ego, I'm clearing out old energy and creating greater space for my soul to emerge. And whether I'm experiencing hatred in myself or hatred in another, I'm clearing old energy so to create more space for love to be fully present in me. And I accept that any moment of darkness is creating more space for light. In any moment of unconsciousness, whether as predator or victim, is creating greater space for consciousness for the hero within me to dawn. All I have to do 
is make peace with uncertainty. And instead of trying to do this a special way, to notice that the way I'm already doing it is how I was created and intended to be. And what you're feeling in the room, whether in person or on this video, what you're feeling right now, the vibrational shift, is you're feeling the relief that spontaneously dawns from uncertainty. And what actually creates that shift is the moment you stop seeking relief from the experiences you think you're mistakenly having. This isn't a mistake. The ego cannot micromanage this with spiritual ideas. Oh, well, if I just wake up and do this, then this life will be this way and not that way. If you believe that, then you'll have other people in your life and you'll go, oh, you know why this is happening to you? Because you're not doing X, Y, and Z like I'm doing. You should be like me. You should be like me. Positive things, inspirational things, trans transformative things, are the things that help you to take great care of yourself emotionally, nutritionally, physically, and energetically as a way of circulating energy on a regular basis as you go through the process of your life that is no mistake, that is predetermined and conspired only to guarantee your highest evolution. But to imagine that you're gonna do all this stuff to control what does and doesn't happen to you is what you wake up from. Your life is not a law of attraction epidemic. <laughs> it is not a low vibrational disaster. <laughs> but you do have an imagination that will pull from the files of your learned consciousness and will sell you some really egregious fantasies. I bet you my life would be different if I could hear my guides. You're only saying that because you're not hearing your guides. You know why you're not hearing your guides? Because your guides are giving you the space to empty out. And your guides are saying, we're not talking to them yet because if we told them what to do, they would just negotiate with us. <laughs> guides, tell me what to do, anything. Anything? <laughs> just sit there for a little bit. You got anything else? No, no we don't. That's why we're up here, you're down there. Your guides know you because they are higher aspects of you. Your guides know you before you even know your motivations, right? You're, here's, here's your conversation with your guides. This is why they don't say anything. Can I ask you a question? And, and there's going to be one guide that goes, just give them one question. There's always that guy that's n the newest on the team, right? You always want to trust the guides that almost look bitter because they know. The guides there in heaven, but look like, you know, they survived the Civil War. You want those guides. But there's always one that goes, just fine, just one question, fine. I go, well, it's really a three-part question. <laughs> and that three-part question leads into a bigger question. You see? No. You're not not hearing your guides because they're talking and you're missing anything. You're not hearing them because they're not speaking to you. And they're not speaking to you because they're preparing you to speak with them once you've woken up out of negotiation. Because what your guides are not going to negotiate with you, which is what most people want to talk to their guides about, is, hey, guides, how can we make this different? The real thing you should ask your guides, and if you really want to feel the presence of your guides and angels in your life like that, you know what you say to your guides? Hey guides, can you 
make your presence known so I can be more soothed as I go through the things that I'm no longer trying to hide from. Ask your guides to support you through your experiences, not to rescue you from your experiences. And that's when the guides go, yep, they're becoming one of us finally. Because guides help guides. Angels assist angels. And you have to start thinking like a guide and an angel. You don't ask the universe to, to, to change your experience. You ask the universe to show you why this experience is the greatest thing that's happening to you and how it's gonna make you a more evolved human being. And if there's anything that can be done to make it easier for you to process the transmutation underway, then wouldn't that be amazing? And when you talk like that to the universe, the universe goes, and now we have a master waking up. And they will, they will serve you more triumphantly than you can even imagine. But what we have to do is we have to stop being in, within this fertile soil of uncertainty looking for a way out. That's what makes it hurt. What's gonna make this stop? Who do I have to cut out of my life to make this pain go away? The ego will sell out anyone. <laughs> anyone anyone. The ego has no value for anything other than what it wants. And so we have to learn that it's the ability to evolve from the fertile soil of our most uncertain experiences and the inability to try to escape our experiences by looking for relief. Because relief is here. But relief is what you receive when you stop seeking it. And the moment you do that, you will have one split second experience of hopelessness. Hopelessness tells you you've entered the doorway of salvation. Just stay there. And your ego, in hopelessness, your ego gives up its control and goes, well, that's it. I'm gonna feel like this forever. And if you sit with that, for like a minute. If you can sit in pure hopelessness and not turn it into a narrative and just feel hopeless, all hope is gone, left behind, all alone. I am doomed forever. And then after forever expires, more doomsday for me as if you're floating in the universe, holding a skull doing some Shakespearean monologue <laughs> of how hopeless you are. Oh, the terror, oh, the pain, forever and ever. And then you stop. And then there's silence. And all of a sudden, you know, it doesn't feel so bad. I think I feel good. How do I feel good? How did that happen? And then there's just space. And from space is where you, as reborn consciousness, blossom into a newly transformed you like a baby born birth from a womb that enters the world. Out of pure space, you are birthed as a new expression of embodied consciousness. And that birth is birthed through the canal of hopelessness if you can allow uncertainty to be faced without needing something to be certain about. Because in the mind of the spiritual ego, there's always the belief that says, if I knew more or did more, I'd feel more of what I want. Not true. Not true at all. And what's fascinating is that a lot of times, 
And I'm someone who's in a position where I'm blessed to say that you come to me with your questions at events, and I'm happy to always use it as an opportunity to guide you into your next level of evolution. When people ask me questions, I intuitively know the next stage they're ready for and how to guide them there. I don't always hear questions as I need to give you an answer, because the answer is just the access to the next level. But a lot of times we have questions when we're in the uncertainty, and we don't realize that some of our questions, if we believe that your salvation is dependent upon the answer to the question you have, is actually just the hiding spot that keeps you from really becoming uncertain. Because if you were to really be uncertain, you would have nothing to know. And without something to fixate on as a reference point of this is and this isn't, without a fixation on knowing, you are now open to all possibilities, which brings you into the entry point of a quantum reality, where there's everything to know, but only at the moment you know it. And you only know what you need to know for as long as you need to know it. And when it's time for it not to be known, something else will take its place. So we learn to allow knowing to come with no grip. No grip. And every level of awakening throughout the infinite realms of enlightenment, at nearly every level, the rules change. And the rules change so you don't hold anything. So you can say, this is true right now, and maybe in five minutes, 30 seconds, or 10 years, it's gonna be different. Just so you can allow the butterfly of clarity to land in the palm of your hand, and it will stay there as long as it's meant to be, but you don't try to close your hand to control its destiny. We don't capture the butterfly, we just hold space for it to land for as little or as long as it's meant to. And when it goes away, another one will come. And we just have the hand open to always receive. Here's a funny question. If you could know everything that you think you need to know right now, what would you do about it? <laughs> like you go, I need to know this. Boom, there it is. Now what are you gonna do? You're gonna go around your life and tell all your friends about the things you know. You don't need to know anything more than you know in order to take care of yourself. You just need to understand how much pain and tension and turmoil you might be in. Because if you're honest about your pain, you'll know how to care for yourself. Just like if you knew the pain other people were in, you'd know how to play the role and be a caring person for them. Now again, you can't get away from you, but you don't have to spend day and night with people you don't resonate with. But what I'm suggesting is if you're around people, your family, your friends, your partner, and whether they're in a story, hiding in it or not, it is your ability to say to someone else, thank you for giving me a chance to spend some more time in the experiences I really don't resonate because you're helping me, me make peace with the things that I've judged in myself. If you do have to spend time with people, we see through the eyes of compassion. And when we see people that are acting harmful, we see innocent beings that are hurting. And I'm not telling you how much time to spend with any person. I'm not telling you to go from one extreme to the other. I'm not saying be in relationships with people that are abusive and call that self-acceptance. I'm just asking you to allow whatever in your life is causing uncertainty to be your deepest point of surrender. And to always remember that before you have the ability to love another person, you will have to successfully, unconditionally love yourself. So when I teach unconditional love, it is always from the standpoint of you first and you only. And when you have been transformed by your own loving nature, that's when you're ready to share with other people. So if you can't be unconditionally loving with other people, it's because not enough has been given to you. Start with you, please. My first book title was Whatever Arises, Love That. 
you are that. That is not out there, that is in here. And of course you will realize that the that in here and the that out there is the same frickin' that. <laughs> but until you realize that, it ain't your truth. It's just whatever rises, love, that. Love this. And look uncertainty square in the eyes and say, now I'm ready for your greatest wisdom. Strip me of all of my judgments, all of my superstitions. And thank you for helping me to see that what I thought was the scariest demon here to attack me was actually my most loyal and steadfast liberator. Welcome uncertainty and say, I'm, well, I'm ready for my journey now. And stop asking uncertainty to treat you differently because that's your job. Uncertainty has a job to do. Its job is to render you uncertain of your narratives. Your job is to love yourself through that holy shit experience. <laughs> and anytime you're trying to use spiritual concepts to try to make something different or better, you're trying to go into a place of certainty. That's not what uncertainty is. Uncertainty is, I don't know. Because knowing is where people hide. When people judge you, they're sharing with you the knowing they hide behind as they hurl rocks at people because they think I'd rather attack others than to be attacked by others. It's a defense mechanism. And the reason why uncertainty is trying to strip you of your knowing is for you to go through the fundamental awakening of consciousness that says, I am knowing itself, not the one hiding behind the things I think I know. I'm that which knows. And I only know what I know the moment I need to know it. And when it's time to know something else, that knowing is done. Feel how different the energy feels. Do you know what this creates for us as not just an experience you're having right now, but a repeat experience every time you watch this video? It frees you from thinking, if I knew why this was happening, I'd be better off. You don't need to know why things are happening. You already know it's happening because it's inspiring your deepest evolution. Your ego doesn't want that answer. It's not juicy enough. <laughs> the ego says, can you keep elaborating until I have someone to blame? <laughs> that's, that's what the ego wants. It wants more juice. But you don't need to know why things are happening. It's happening only for your highest evolution. The question isn't why is this happening? The question is, how much relief will be present if I stop looking for relief? And there's that silence again. Do you know what that silence is? The true narrative of life's epic saga. We're out of the spaciousness of infinite possibility came the sound of a word. And within that word, infinite worlds, parallel dimensions, and quantum realities were birthed, where all births and all deaths happen simultaneously. And the witness of the word out of the silence yearned to know itself as all those simultaneous incarnations and created a vacuum of space and time to experience 
the living reality of its own infinite majestic narrative, otherwise known as life. This is where life gets beautiful. And whether you are reduced into a pile of tears or you are buried by the pain you don't know how to micromanage and avoid, the deeper you go into the grit of your experience, the more surprisingly beautiful it becomes. There is free will, but your free will is you choosing how to care for yourself in response to life circumstances and how to view things in a way that is most supportive for you so that you can be the most open, expressive, and heart-centered even when your circumstances seem to be otherwise. There is free will. It's just not control. It is the will of the freedom within you. But that freedom freely wants to only be you as you are. And when you want to be you under different circumstances, that's when you split from the will of your freedom. And the more you care and love yourself, the more you will realize what's happening to me is not a mistake, it's not a curse, it's not a spell. It is the greatest thing that happened to me for the evolution of my consciousness and I don't have to like it one bit. Not one bit. Just feel. Feel the difference. <coughs> Let everyone have their narrative. When the freedom of will has woken up in you, a narrative is optional. And then there will be that moment where you take a step in your life and you will literally step out of your narrative like a version of yourself you've outgrown and you'll even forget it was even there. And the moment you don't have a narrative is the moment that it's okay that everyone else does. <clears throat> or metaphorically speaking, the people that are the most bothered by babies crying are the adults that forget their childhood. So spirituality is about the sacred journey of remembrance because it's so easy to forget, isn't it? And the more we remember, the more compassionate and loving we become to ourselves and to others because this world needs us. It needs the light of consciousness and that's what we are gonna anchor while other aspects of the world do what they're designed to create and play out. We are here to be the anchors of light, to be the way showers of love, kindness, and compassion. And what you wake up out of when you unplug from the collective narratives is you unplug from the energy of unconscious retaliation that says, they act unconscious, I reflect it right back. No, 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 no. We learned earlier today what true forgiveness is. They act unconsciously. What do we do? Move them to the front of the line. Now, oh, please, please, please. 
You're acting that way, front of the line in heaven. Please. Who drinks from the fountain of youth first? Those who are the most thirsty. And the ones that are the most dehydrated, spiritually speaking, are the ones acting the most egregiously. And when you have this, and every time you spend time in this transmission with me, you are soaking and basking in the glory of your own awakened consciousness. You are remembering it's not one person on this planet who carries the Messiah code of spiritual royalty. All of us come from spiritual royalty. And when you start holding yourself in this kind of regard and you start respecting the royalty and regard, no matter how buried it is in another human being, you remember the kingdom that you ran before you came here on this little field trip. And it's called the kingdom of heaven. We are all descendants of spiritual royalty. We are all rulers of heaven's kingdom. And we came down here to bring royalty to life. So we hold ourselves in the highest regard and we treat others with the utmost respect. And those that are having the most difficult time within themselves or disrespecting others, we move to the front of the line to the power of forgiveness. And we start embodying our light. This is the shift that happens when we face uncertainty. And as always, no matter how things seem or appear, on behalf of the universe, on behalf of the kingdom that you are from, that you reside in, as always, I'm here to be with you every step of the way, and I love you so much. Namaste.